All right, well, I do know some of you, and it was so wonderful for you to invite me into your classes while I was on the ship, of course, and then, you know, give up another day of class for me today. So I do appreciate that and letting or having you um, let me come in. So uh, we were in the Isobon and Mariana for Ark. I want to show you where that is because it's one of those things where, what? Who's heard of it, right? So, of course, here we are, right? And then over here, this cool little chunk of islands is what? Japan. Japan, close. All right, so that's Japan. And so we were about half a world away. I did cut off some of the planet here because, not that they're not important, but they just weren't that important to what we were doing. So super zoom in, this is once again Japan, good. This is Yokohama, our port of call. So this is sort of a zoomed in version of where exactly we were. Uh, this dark, dark line here shows the deepest part of the ocean. Anyone knows where that is? The Marianas Trench. Okay, so it's really, really deep. And it is where there is a subduction zone. There is a plate, the Pacific plate, going underneath the Philippine um, plate. And so what you have is a very, very deep part there where this Pacific plate is scooting underneath the other. There were two other expeditions in this area. Uh, we were the four arc. There's an arc of islands, an island arc area, which is caused by subduction zones. And I'm going to go into that just a little bit. And so there was an expedition in the rear arc area, way back to the west, not that far. And then in the middle area, the middle of the arc area, the arc islands. So that's where we were in general. Now I'm going to super zoom in again just to our expedition so that you can see what we did while we were there. Again, Mariana's Trench, and then we had four <coughs> drill sites just in that one area. And so what we were doing is we were kind of sloping up from that subduction zone right where those two plates came together. So that's where we drilled. This was a little bit downslope, if you're talking about the bottom of the ocean. Deeper water, okay, so about 4.8 kilometers of water. And then up here, only about 3.1 kilometers deep. So that's kind of what we did. We hopped along there. What were the expedition goals? Some of this is a little highfalutin language, but I'll try to break it down for you. Overall, what we were looking at is arc evolution. To evolve means to change, right? You've evolved as students through the years. So what we're looking at is that arc area, that island arc area, and how did it evolve or change since subduction initiation, when subduction first began, which was also what we were interested in looking at. And then also continental crust formation. Every step you take on this land, all right, on the continental crust, all right, it was formed in the bottom of the oceans. Well, not everyone, let's say you're walking around a volcanic area. There's a few spots in, say, Hawaii or whatever. But that was continental or ocean crust at one point, And now you've got a volcano that's shot up through the ocean surface. You're walking on land, it was once ocean crust. So that's why we're interested in where did this land come from, how did it form? All right, so we're gonna drill through the entire volcanic sequence. What that means is we're looking at layers. What formed first? What kind of volcanic rocks were there initially at the beginning of subduction? And what kind of or, sorry, volcanic rocks came after that? Uh, we're going to look at how the magma chemistry changes. When you first have subduction and seawater starts pouring in underneath these plates, that mixes with the lava, that mixes with what is under there originally, that mantle, that liquid rock, and so that changes the chemistry. And as that lava starts coming up towards the surface, some of that chemistry is changed a bit because it becomes minerals and sort of crystallizes out. And so we're looking at how does that chemistry change over the course of that development of that crust. Um, we also want to look at how the mantle melting changes uh, during and after subduction initiation. That ocean water changes the melting point. Just like if you're sprinkling salt on a sidewalk right now because you don't want the ice to, or the water to form ice and freeze, 
we're changing the melting point of that water. Ocean water changes the melting point of rocks. And yes, rocks melt, right? You know a little bit about that. All right, and then this was just, uh, there had been a lot of expeditions in the area not to drill, although there were a few drilling expeditions. There were a lot of submarine expeditions where they went under in submarines and collected rocks and looked at them from different areas and were saying, okay, here's how we think the layering happens based on what we collected, but we want to show that by actually drilling into those layers. So the reason I put that up there is your scientists right now, the scientists who are on the ship, they're also using that scientific method. They're testing the hypotheses that they have. They're going out to collect some data. And right now they're trying to write reports and put together all that data into something that can say, yep, here's the answer we got from all that. And they're gonna take a little while to put all that together. And then this is the fancy schmancy words here, but another hypothesis, there are these ophiolite sequences. There are certain type of rock in certain types of layers that are found in mountains, mountains all around the world, all right? And so what scientists were saying is, well, we're pretty sure that these are formed way down in the ocean crust when subduction first begins. We want to see if we can prove that. We want to see if we can actually find that exact same sequence of rocks. And so fancy schmancy name for that, ophiolites, it's just a very specific layer. And I'm not sure how many rock terms you guys know, but I can kind of go into that later if, if you guys have questions about that. And of course, you guys are a geo class, right? Lithosphere, have you heard that term at all? All right, lithosphere is where, what? If you've got layers of the earth, this one is, the lithosphere is, across, somebody said it, crust, you're near the top, right? We're talking top layer, okay, all right. So, so anyway, so we're talking this stuff that we're walking around on. All right, that is all right, it's early in the morning, I get it, right? I'm barely functioning right now too, so. <laughs> all right. Okay, so this is, there's a lot of words here that you don't have to pay that much attention to, but I wanted to show you the schematic of what's going on when I'm throwing out these words, subduction, initiation, that kind of thing. Um, about 55 million years ago, give or take a few years, we're talking geologic time here, uh, we have these two plates that were coming in together. They kind of were running into each other and one of them sort of lost out, right, and started to dip underneath. Well, what the scientists are looking at here is when that first happens, there's a bit of a separation, which allows this asthenosphere, that is a hard word to say, which is where compared to the lithosphere? Right, good, okay. So it allows that to kind of come up and build this sort of initial land, not land, but ocean crust right there where those two plates come together. And so that's originally coming up there and forming what will become this arc area, all right? So then we have that sort of build up there. And again, what is the initial lava that's coming up? And what is the lava that's coming up after that subduction has already happened and has gone on for a while? So originally we're saying, oh, okay, that's kind of some pure mantle there that's coming up. But then we've got the, the island arc beginning to form, that piece of crust that's branching or bridging between those two plates. And then eventually over time, 41 million years ago or so to the present, we have this four arc built up. So that's just where we were drilling and we were interested in this area right there. Uh, side view, if I could cut away the planet and look and see what our drill sites were getting into. Uh, bonanite, I believe I mentioned that. It's, it's one of those terms that you'll probably never learn that unless you go to a really high level um, geoscience class. Maybe you're going into geology or petrology or something like that in college and you might start hearing about that. It is just a really 
really, really, really hot forming rocks. So you need really high temperatures to form this, except if we get some seawater in there, we can change the melting point and lower the melting point. And so this forms in an area where there is a subduction zone where seawater can mix in with that mantle. And so this is kind of a special type of rock that is found in subduction zones where you have that seawater mixing, as opposed to say a mid-ocean ridge, where you just have that pure mantle kind of coming up and you've got seafloor spreading, moving out from that original spot. So it's a little bit different here. And so we find bonanite in these special subduction zone areas. So it wasn't really a surprise that we drilled into a whole lot of that. And I did bring some back for you to be able to look at because it's not something you find around here very often. Uh, we also drilled into, in that deeper depths of water, we didn't drill in quite as far into the, sub, the basement. But here we were, we were getting into a different type of basalt than what you might find at a mid-ocean ridge, where again, you don't have the mixing with the seawater underneath. And so this has the name that they've put to this as forearc basalt, a distinct chemistry signature that's different from other lava rocks. All right, so uh, I want to let you ask some questions. And so I'm going to show you some bonanites. And while I'm showing you those, you can certainly ask some questions just so you know what we ended up with. Even though we drilled into way more depths than this, we brought up about one and a quarter kilometers of actual hard rock core. And so that all had to be stored on the ship, we cut it into smaller pieces and we stored it on the ship. And then also some sediment, which I did bring back some of the sediment for you guys to look at as well. Uh, we did get kind of what we expected. We got four arc basalt, where we thought we would get four arc basalt, and we got bonanites where we thought we would get bonanites. So that was one of those things where the scientists said, okay, yes, we got what we thought we were supposed to get. Now, how do we put that together into the story? How do we fill in the blanks and say, oh, well, this is how the story happened. All right, so what I'd like to do, I was kind of crazy. On the ship, they all kind of thought I was nuts. Because what I would do is I said, if there's any rocks, I want them because I wanted to take my show on the road when I got back. So what I did was every time they hollered core on deck, I went running up to the catwalk and I went to the, the core catcher table and I would pull out whatever rocks fell out of the bottom of the core catcher, which is the very bottom of the core barrel that goes all the way down to the ocean floor. And I have some core catcher subs as well, little part that hits the bottom first. And I would pull out those rocks because all they were going to do was throw them over the edge anyway. So what I have here is for 1439, that was the hole that we started at, but I have the entire core represented in small pieces. So I'm going to actually pass that around, but I want you to look for that greenish color bonanite. It kind of comes and goes a little bit every once in a while. Because this is a subduction zone, we've got two plates running into each other. There's fractures all the time. There's little broken parts that happen. This is an earthquake zone, right? So you'll sometimes get some different types of rock that have sort of moved in position. And so I want you to notice that as well. But you'll see there's kind of a green tint to it. If you have trouble seeing colors, you may just say, oh, those are all gray rocks. That's what my brother said. No, oh, those are just gray rocks. But some of you will be able to see that, that transition into the bonanite and then sometimes back again. So they are numbered. They're in sort of groups of 10. There were a few times that I had to mix together some core samples, but for the most part, you've got the entire range here. Now, the cores, every time you go down, you drill down 10 meters. <clears throat> so if you've gone down 10 meters each time, you may not always bring up 10 meters of hard rock core because you're grinding away that rock. You may only bring up a meter and a half, a meter, less than a meter. But we still drill down to core number 45 on this one. So core number 45 would be how far beneath the seafloor. If you're going down 10 meters each time, four, 450 meters, right? 
Now there was a layer of sediment on top, which for this particular hole, we sort of blew through it. So there was uh, probably 70 meters or so of sediment on top of this, maybe even more. So that doesn't tell you the full story, but at least tells you once we hit basement, once we hit rock, we started going in, we went 450 meters total, all right? So I'll try to keep these in order as I hand them around and you guys can just kind of send them from table to table. And while you're doing that, so there's the first one on top, uh, if there are any questions at this point, I've been rambling on for way too long. I don't usually talk that long in class. So are there any questions? Not even, doesn't even have to be about what I just said about the expedition in general. I know, first hour, it's so hard to wake up. Yeah. Uh, cool Pardon me? Cool animals? Uh, lots of fish. We had some mahi mahi. We had some tuna. Uh, there were flying fish. Has anyone seen flying fish before? Unbelievable. I thought they would just be like stones skipping on the water, you know, whatever. They actually take off. They're like 100 feet later, they land. It's unbelievable. So we had a little talk about how. That's some pretty cool evolution there. Uh, you know what? There's a whole group of men on the ship who do the drilling, who are, you know, kind of the, the base of the ship. They, they get the job done. And their culture, most of them are from the Philippines. So their culture, of course, they're an island nation, is all about the fishing. So they did a lot of spear fishing over the side. The unfortunate thing is when they got a tuna or mahi-mahi, they would just share it with each other. They'd send it into the galley and the cooks would prepare it for them. So I never really got the fresh tuna or mahi-mahi. But they, these guys, it was unbelievable. They'd have like this spear, it looked like the trident. It had all these, and they'd throw it in there off one of the decks of the ship and they'd hit those fish. I couldn't believe it. But that's their, you know, that's where they're from. That's part of their culture. So, kind of cool. Any others? We did see a lot of squid too, and what was interesting about the squid is when we sent down our camera to re-enter the hole, we'd have to bring up the drill bit, change the drill bit, send the whole string back, and so we had a funnel at the bottom that we would send the string back into the hole. We needed a camera to see. The camera has lights on it. And so the squid would start coming around once we brought the camera up towards the surface where the squid are, start swimming around the camera. And so it was kind of entertaining. We're all sitting there watching TV, but it's TV squid TV. TV. Uh, yeah, actually in Taiwan, I had some squid for dinner. Nice. Yep. It wasn't caught from over the edge of the ship, though. You were on the boat for two months? Two months, yep. We got on board. We were still in port until... September 4th, or sorry, August 4th, but we got on the ship August 1st. We actually got into port a little bit early, earlier than expected. So we actually got into Keelung, Taiwan on the 28th of September, but we didn't leave the ship until, I mean, we left the ship, but we still stayed overnight on the ship um, until the 29th. So just about two months. Yeah. How was the weather? Hot and humid hot and humid, and the sun would come up super early, like, you know, 5, 5.30 in the morning, and it would be a long, hot day. But what was cool for me is that I worked the night shift so that I could be on the same time as you guys here. So my shift started at 6 p.m., which is about your 5 a.m. or so, and so I actually was asleep during the hottest part of the day and when I would come out at night like the vampires do then you know it was slightly cooler still pretty hot though um, we did all the measurements and metric it was about 29 degrees C consistently which is in that mid 80s range low to mid 80s so I think that's it any other questions It was pretty tiny. However, what was really nice is I didn't have to share my room. Most people had to share their teeny tiny little room. Uh, the good thing is the way the shifts are set up, though, is that anybody who has to share a room, you work on the opposite shift of the person you share the room with. 
So most of the shifts for the scientists was noon to midnight or midnight to noon. And so those scientists would, you know, come on shift at noon, but the other scientists would, in their room would be coming off the shift at that time. So they didn't have to, you got your own room for about 10, 11 hours of the day. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so I wanted to show you some sediments. The sediments could tell us that we went back to the Eocene in geologic time. And just in case you've forgotten some of that, I did throw in a geologic time scale for more recently, but I'm not quite there yet. I wanted to show you some of the sediments. This was, again, one of the reasons people thought I was sort of crazy, uh, because these are actual sediments from Expedition 352. Every time you bring up sediments and you're in a new site, it's required by the program that you test these sediments for specifically hydrocarbons. All right, hydrocarbons are what? Chemistry here, throwing out some chemistry. All right, petroleum is a hydrocarbon. It's a big molecule that has carbon and hydrogen bonded together. So there's some specific tests that need to be done on those sediments, and one of them is pore water tests. They're going to collect what's in between the sediments and test that water and see what do we got in there? Do we have any volatiles? Volatiles would mean something that could explode, right? Catch fire, burst into flames, that kind of thing. So you cut off the outside part of that core. It comes up as a cylinder. You cut off the outside of that core because that would have mixed with more seawater. It would have mixed with uh, maybe some of the mud that is sent through. Every time you're drilling in, you got to kick out from the hole any of the ground up rocks, anything that might fall back down into the hole. And so you've got what's called drilling mud, which is mostly seawater, but it has a few other things in it to make it more viscous or thick. So you pump that in to carry out any of those little ground up rock parts. Well, when you cut off the outside of the sediment, it's still perfectly good to take to a classroom. All right, so I went around, I'm like, you gonna use that sediment that's there in the bucket? And they were just gonna throw it over the edge, so I'm like, I got it. So I can tell by looking at the color of this sediment, I can tell what it's made of, okay? I'm not magical or anything, but because it's such a light, light, light color, that tells us that it's actually, this is sediment that's made from tiny, tiny, tiny fossilized organisms. They have calcium carbonate shells. This is like what limestone's made of, okay? So if you've ever seen pictures of the White Cliffs of Dover, or something that's made of limestone, you have this very, very light color and it's made on the fossilized remains of tiny planktonic organisms, little tiny organisms, we call them foraminifera, or even smaller than that, nanofossils that might be diatoms. So what we see here, as I know, is full of microscopic organisms. So I'm actually, I don't know if we'll have a lot of time for that today, but I am going to leave some behind so that you guys can make smear slides of these if you would like to. And so that way you can look, I put up, well, we put up a microfossil poster that has some examples of what you might see. And I ordered some extra of those for you for your class. So those should be coming in, I hope. All right. So what can we tell by looking at sediments? You can look at different rates of sedimentation. You might, if you have a really high planktonic colonization period, you may have a lot of sediments that are falling to the bottom because basically the sediments are mostly dead floating creatures, right? Like these little plankton, these little microscopic organisms, they just fall to the bottom when they die. And so you might say, oh my gosh, for this thousand years we got about five centimeters of sediment, but for this thousand years, we only got one centimeter of sediment. So it tells you a little bit about what the rate of sedimentation is. And it's not just microscopic organisms that are falling down there. What if you have a volcanic eruption and you shoot a whole bunch of ash into the air? That's gonna land on the ocean and that's also going to rain down, just like a rainstorm or a blizzard or whatever. So we caught 
three different times of highly explosive volcanism. That just means in our sediments, we noticed that there were some three distinct sections that said, whoa, there were a lot of volcanoes going off right now because we found a lot of ash in the sediments. Um, so that, we'll wait on that. You want to wait till the end and see if we have time for that? Okay. Uh, just to point this out, when we said that we got to the Eocene and we learned that from the microfossils, I, mean, I have a slide in a second that will tell you about that. Notice that the Eocene runs from about 55.8 million years ago, give or take. And you may not remember this, but back when I was saying, okay, subduction initiation, the start of subduction happened about, anyone remember? Probably not. 55 million years ago. So we were all happy to say, oh my goodness, look where we are. We're in the Eocene, which is where we expected to be if, in fact, that's when subduction initiation was beginning. So how do we know that? How do we know that we got to the Eocene just by looking at our sediments? Well, if you look at the actual fossils that are in there, some of them went extinct during certain parts in our past. And so if you're looking at the sediments and there's none of this particular nanofossil, small, small, small fossil, or microfossil, pretty small fossil, if you only see you know, this one once you get to a certain depth, then you know, okay, wait, this went extinct about this geologic time and now I'm finding it, but I wasn't finding it before. So those microorganisms that are in this sediment are actually markers for us. They tell the time. So they can tell us how far down we've gotten, how many years past we've gotten. Um, something else that we didn't care about on this expedition, but if you're going on a climate-oriented expedition, certain marine fossil, or marine animals, certain marine plankton, they live in various temperature zones. So if you're in a climate expedition and you're thinking, <clears throat> okay, I'm at the equator and now I'm finding microfossils of organisms that live in the Arctic or the Antarctic, what does that tell you about that equatorial region where you're hanging out right now? It was cold at some point. So it could have been cold for two reasons. One could have been that piece of the crust got moved, things shifted around a bit, and it used to be up here and now it's here. Or it means what's been going on to the climate. Changing climate, right? And you can also, the opposite happens, where you find in the Arctic organisms that are found at high temperatures, and the Arctic waters are not that warm, right? So you're finding organisms in those uh, sediments that are, again, telling you a little bit about what life was like back thousands and millions and millions of years ago. And then finally, <clears throat> this is extra bonus. I'm not going to go into this too much. But if you, if you study chemistry at some point and you learn about isotopes, there are ways to grind up those little shells and you can actually look and see what kind of what kind of climate there was many years ago based on the chemical composition of those shells. So that's another way to use these sediments to help us tell about global climate in the past, but to also tell us a little bit about what time we're in. Okay, so speaking of that, I have some other materials from other expeditions that I wanted to show you. Those of you who had me when I went on School of Rock, uh, if you had me as a teacher back then, then you've already seen some of this. But uh, are there any questions while I pull out stuff for another expedition or two? Okay. So there's something called the Cretaceous impact back in our history as a planet. Um, anyone hear about what happened to the dinosaurs? We're good. They died, right? I'm glad. I wouldn't want like a T-Rex eyeball poking in the window right now. That would be kind of freaky. But anyway, so they died. And the um, evidence seems to indicate that there was a very large meteor that struck the Earth somewhere around the Yucatan Peninsula. And off the southeast coast of the United States, this particular drilling program went 
Joy's resolution went there and drilled some cores off the southeast coast of the United States and found this core, this section of core, and this seemed to indicate to scientists that something big happened. It's like normal sediment, sediment, sediment. There's a little bit of volcanic ash here, but a lot of marine microfossils. Normal sediment, maybe again, thousand years for every you know, one to five centimeters, depending on if there was a volcano, which would make a lot more sediment. And then all of a sudden we got something that looks like asphalt, like somebody paved, all right? Uh, based on, based on the microorganisms, the fossils in the sediment, this seemed to happen, and again, this is the bottom, so these are the oldest sediments building up. This seemed to happen based on the organisms that were found in the sediments around 65 million years ago, which is where that Cretaceous boundary is where huge mass extinction happened. So what can you learn from ocean drilling? Well, you can learn a lot about the history of our planet because while this took many, many thousands of years to lay down, it, they figure based on what's going on here, the kind of material they're seeing, that this big region right here probably only took anywhere from a day to maybe 60 days, okay? So instantaneously, boom, a whole bunch of that meteor fallout went flying down onto the ocean. And again, this was southeast U.S. This isn't that far from the Yucatan Peninsula. And so this went down, rained down on the planet almost instantaneously. And then as the higher um, ash and fallout went going around the earth, then some more fell out. And so there's probably a little bit here that fell out a little bit later, not instantaneously, but pretty much very short period of time. And then there's a lot of iron in meteors, okay? They're almost completely iron and ice. So there's this little layer of rust at the top that they figure was part of a fireball that, you know, spewed out from there. And then that would be some oxidized iron there at the top. But then you start getting sediment again. So one of the things scientists looked at is they said, okay, so what's in the sediment that's below this impact zone? And what's in the sediment that's above it? Because that tells us a little bit about what's going on in the life of our planet. And with all of this junk in the air, what are you doing with the sun? You're blocking the sun. So this is, this is in our atmosphere now. And while a lot of it is falling out, there's tiny, tiny pieces that are able to be held aloft. And those can just, you know, again, stay in the atmosphere for quite a while. Um, I do have a picture of the drill site relative to the Yucatan Peninsula down here. The green is what scientists believe the continents looked like at the time of the Cretaceous impact. And then the yellow is the outline of current continents. So I'll pass that around. I want to also show you what those tiny microfossils looked like before. So this is an electron micrograph, very special kind of microscope, an electron microscope that gives you really nice pictures. This is an electron micrograph of the type of organisms, tiny planktonic organisms that were found in the deeper layers of sediment. And then this is what happened, what we saw afterwards. Same magnification, all right? So everybody cares about the dinosaurs, but you know what? Some other things went extinct too, all right? There's some other foraminifera here that didn't make it, all right? These teeny tiny ones seem to have made it. Um, and, and again, it could have a lot to do with the amount of sunlight that's coming through, the amount of nutrients that are in the water at this point. Um, it could be based on what was buried, right? A lot of those, even though they swim around up here, if you're getting crashed on with a whole bunch of fallout that looks like asphalt, you're going to probably get chunked to the bottom pretty quickly if you're pretty big. So there's probably a combination of reasons for why these organisms changed so much. And then the electron micrograph of what that dark material is looks like this, and it doesn't really look living. It looks like beads of glass or something like that. So, 
Uh, the, other, the other core model that I brought with me is from the Antarctic. And this isn't quite as exciting, but I'll let you actually, if you're careful with it, because these cost a ton of money to make. If you're careful with it, I'll let you pass it around because I think you can see the layers much better. In the Antarctic, what's it like in the winter time? Cold, and then what sort of are you seeing when you look out at night? Okay, how about at day? How's that different from night? Is there a lot of sun there, say, on the, you know, shortest day of the year, which is what, June 21st or something like that for them? They get light at, during the day? No, they don't. It's completely dark there for certain times of the year. Now, along the edge of the Antarctic continent, you'll probably see some light, but anything within that Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, you're going to get very limited sunlight during the winter. So what you'll see is you'll see sediment layers. And these sediment layers are seasonal changes that show spring to summer. Okay, why do you think we're only seeing spring and summer changes in sediment? There are a lot of organisms really going to town and living their life during the dark of winter. No, not really. And so you have these what's called blooms, just like if you've heard of an algae bloom in a pond or something like that where it goes out of control and it's all green. You have these blooms of organisms where they just go crazy, reproduce, that kind of thing, but then they slow down and they don't live as much. When you have a lot of life, when it dies, rains down to the bottom of the ocean, but then during the winter months, it's going to stop, it's going to slow down. So you can actually see layers on there. Uh, there's actually a rock too, which probably would have come from uh, an iceberg or something that was calved off of a glacier. All right, the last thing I want to pass around, I talked to you about core catcher subs. And core catchers are just the very bottom of the core barrel. When you are drilling, whether it's for sediment or rock, you've done a lot of work to get that rock or that sediment. You don't want to pull up that core barrel and have it all fall back out into the bottom of your hole, right? So a core catcher does exactly what it sounds like. In sediments, there's actually a door, a trap door that closes so that you can bring up that 10 meter long core barrel and not lose all the sediment. And with rocks, there's like these little teeth that kind of grab on. So what I did was I brought, and these were really smelly last week because I had sprayed them with a lacquer to kind of protect them, but I brought a core catcher sub that looks pretty normal. And then I brought a core catcher sub that happened on this expedition. If any of you read in the blogs about the, the um, drill bit that was eaten by the hole. Did anyone read about that one? Okay, so we had a drill bit that actually was just ground away by the hole. This is the core catcher sub that was there. We knew something was wrong when we pulled up the core barrel and the core catcher sub looked like it had been ground away. This should never come in contact with the bottom of the hole. The drill bits should be there. And so this was really weird and we knew we had a problem. Right here is a picture of the drill bit. And it's a little bit deceiving because it looks like this guy sticks out, um, but it's not. That's a different type of bit that you can add in there. But you have these four cones and then this sub will fit above it. This would actually be turned if you were looking at the bottom, uh, looking up from the bottom of the hole. So this should never come in contact with the bottom, and yet it did. So these are kind of heavy, but I will pass them around so that you can take a look. I'll actually start them here because you guys have not had to start anything yet. So you can do that comparison. I did get, again, I was just like stripping the ship clean. It was sort of like, oh, are you going to use that? Okay, I'll take it. So this is one of those four cones that they, the four will rotate as the drill string rotates. The four cones will rotate around each other. Each one of them is slightly different. They fit into each other like puzzle pieces. And so uh, this one, I still need to polish this one down and spray it, but just be careful. Don't drop any of these on your feet because that would hurt. Uh, so those are those are actual, for actually from this expedition, and then 
I believe we only used this one a couple of times. Uh, this is when you're when you're doing uh, sediment drilling. It's kind of like getting a shot in the arm. Only nobody ever removes stuff from you when they give you a shot in the arm. Okay, but there's a hollow tube that gets shot into the sediment. Core catcher closes and you bring it up. It might take 20, 30 minutes at the most to bring that up because it's quick. You shoot that into the sediment, close the door, bring it up. But sometimes that sediment, it becomes packed under intense pressure and it's called lithified. All right, it starts getting more like rock, starts getting harder. And so at the end of that piston core, they might put this drill bit, which would just, again, spin around, rotate. Unfortunately, some of the teeth are missing. There's some insert tungsten carbide teeth that would fit in there, and some are broken. But you can still get an idea for what would be happening here at the very end of the drill bit. Okay? So. All right, so I think the only other thing I wanted to show you is I did get a thin section slide. And I think I mentioned to most of the classes that you can cut rocks so thin that you can see through them. So I really wanted to bring one of these back to you, but it's extremely fragile. So when I pass it around, I want you to make sure you don't hit it with one of the drill bits. And if you hold it up to the light, you'll see that it's, it's completely see-through, right? The light will travel through it. So pretty translucent. We can put these on a microscope, and we can look at them and tell a lot about the chemistry of this rock. Okay, so whew, we got a lot of stuff going around. I know we're running short on time. Before I go into why we do this in some of the years, I have about five minutes. Yeah, we actually have like, we're done at 25 to. Are you in Japan? I was in Japan for just a few days. Um, I didn't do a lot of shopping because I knew that I didn't take anything that I bought back with me. It was very limited. It doesn't have a crystal structure. 
shiny, shiny surface to these, these lavas. And actually scientists like collecting those because they are the purest form of that magma or lava, the purest form of what came out of the, you know, Asinosphere, or what was that melted rock before, depending on what you're getting. So that actually is a very pure example of what the lava was like right then at that moment. And then underneath, you'll have slower cooling, so you'll have crystals forming underneath that, that black, shiny crust. So it's, yeah, you're going to have hot, hot lava coming in contact with a cold, cold ocean, and so you can get sort of explosive results. But you can also get these pillow lavas, which it's almost like if you took a tube of toothpaste and you sort of squeezed a little out, you like bloop, right? And then you do it again, bloop, right? So you can have these pillow lavas that kind of look like that as well. They look like little pillows with this black crust over them. Bless you. Yeah. So when there's all this really hot magma and lava coming out, like doesn't it affect the ocean around it and make it like a little bit warmer, or is it just that the ocean's so cold that it just cools off all the magma before you know anything is affected to the water? Like I feel like if you got close to magma, it's like oh, this water's a lot warmer. Yeah, yeah, and I would say right around it that would be true. Um, but water has what's called a very high heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water, even just one degree Celsius. And so while you might right there where they're meeting, those molecules of the water are going to increase in energy. As, as the energy is being passed to that water, bless you, those molecules will increase in energy and they're taking the energy from that molten rock, right? And so right there, you'll have an increase in energy. But that'll dissipate really quickly because you have tons of water molecules. And so that energy is going to dissipate and just move through those other water molecules and be diluted pretty quickly. What was that? Okay. Pond, ocean. Well, this would be a good time to talk about how much of our planet is ocean. Um, so why do we do ocean exploration? I talked to Mrs. Greif this morning while I was coming to your room, and I said, you know, to me, this is like NASA for our planet, okay? We know more about the moon, about Mars, about these planets out in space than we do about our own planet. Because 70% of our planet, 71%, is covered with water. And about 90-ish, mid-90s percent of that is ocean. So of the 70% that covers our planet, most of that is ocean water. And oceans are deep, right? So they're hard to get to. They're really hard to get to. And the technology limits what we can do and how far. I brought this back for Mrs. Johnston. Uh, this cup was sent to the bottom, not this cup, but a cup this side was, size was sent to the bottom of the ocean at 4.8 kilometers, and this is what happened. Right? This is a foam cup. There's a lot of gas in here to make that foam, to make it a good insulator, and under that pressure, all that gas was squished out, and this is what happened to the cup. Imagine what would happen to you, okay? So the ocean is actually harder to reach the bottom than it was to reach the moon. It's ridiculous how hard it is to reach that because of how intense that pressure. Do you mind if they touch this? I could pass this around. <laughs> Just don't break it because it's priceless, priceless foam cup. But anyway, um, so, so it's, uh-oh, be gentle, good. Um, so anyway, what, and it was just a standard six ounce cup. So anyway, it takes a lot of energy to get to the bottom of the ocean. Um, those of you who remember last year when that Malaysian airline plane went down, you know, people were saying, well, why can't you find that plane? What's wrong with you people? Okay, well, it's at the bottom of the ocean and we haven't really even begun to explore that when you consider how vast that is. So we can learn a lot about global climate in the past. We can learn a lot about how our planet was formed 
and how it is still changing today. Okay, ocean crust is going to continue to become continental crust. We want to know how that happens. So how can you be involved? Well, you could be a scientist. Uh, there were even some students on the ship. They were students who were working on their master's degree or PhD, but they were still students. Um, there are uh, places for technicians. Many of the technicians just had bachelor's degree, regular four-year college. Uh, there are places for computer specialists. Believe me, I went to the computer specialists a lot when I was trying to do some broadcasting and had some problems. Engineers, uh, there's our whole engine system that runs, you've got diesel engines that are actually our power plant. They run every light that you turn on and off. You have to um, desalinate water to drink, so you have anything you need energy for. Um, and then different trades that you might have as well. What do you guys say? Thank you. Thank you.